Hello, this is Skix of Skixie's Greater Shows. Welcome to Here Comes the Weirdo Parade, episode whatever, something in the teens. I have two guests today, lucky you, two for the price of one, uh, and you're probably watching it for free, so that's that's a really good deal. Um, my friends, we can see your name under the uh, under the screen, but could you introduce yourselves, please? You're first in the list. Okay. So, oh, I am. Yeah. 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 So I am Rachel. I also go by Bickle, and my pronouns are they, them. And I'm Alex, and my pronouns are she, her. All right. Welcome. As you know, this is a podcast about weirdos. I, I, I hope that was clear from the start. I have yet to have anyone storm out when I, when I let them know, but... Could you share with the nice people some of the ways in which you are weirdos, in which you are uh, outsiders, edge cases, um, within your, your comfort level of sharing? Well, um, I don't know. I've always felt like I was outside of everything. Growing up, I identified the most with Spock or Peter DeVries from Dune as a Mentat. I felt like I was a Mentat. Um, became obsessed with with Dune. Um, and I always felt like I didn't quite fit in with everything, um, the entire world, and that I didn't belong on this world and probably was not a human. And I still question that when people say, oh, we're all humans. I'm like, <laughs> maybe not me, but that's all right. Um, and as I've gotten older, I've learned more and more about my specific weirdness. Um, I am at, when I was much younger, I first came out as bisexual. As I got older, I realized also trans. And then as I, around that same time, I realized hmm, actually autistic as well. Um, uh, and lots of other things that have all come into this big ball of who I am. So, um, I don't know. I'm an alien. Okay. That's the short answer. <laughs> That's fair. Nice. I think, um, the earliest part of it for me was like growing up as a military brat. Um, my dad was in the army. So every three years it was pack up and move. And, um, like our last posting before my parents split was Berlin, Germany. So like there's very much this, like, being an outsider from the like over cold, like not quite fitting into German culture, but then also not quite feeling, fitting into the military base culture either. And that was really, it was hard. Um, and then kind of growing up a sci-fi geek, like I loved Star Trek and Doctor Who and, and like, Blake Seven a little bit like we got a bit when we were moving to Berlin got a bit of Blake Seven which was like even more cardboard set design than Doctor Who was right um and yeah I went through the same sort of like I tried identifying as gay in my twenties as a gay male in my twenties um expanded that to bisexual in my thirties figured out that there was some gender stuff going on and have gone from like tried a really hard femme presentation that didn't match up for me very well and kind of have angled back towards like complicated non-binary but feminine but yeah lots of lots of weird boundary identities and interests was there um, a certain amount of like experimental, like let's try this and see if it fits, let's try that, let's tweak this variable, let's... Yeah, I think in a lot of different ways, like for, like I can think back to my 20s where it's like, okay, am I, let me try being a club kid. Well, that didn't work. Let me try being a theater kid. Well, that kind of works. Let me try um in terms of like gender presentation yeah i mean i 
I've owned some dress since like my 20, early 20s, like a little black dress. And that was just like, hey, Halloween, <laughs> let's let's dress up in this and see how that how that feels for me. Um, but yeah, it's it's changed. I've tried different things. I've I'm not even sure that I'm settled now. Like this is this is where I happen to be. And I think like there's there's an amount of um having that be always changing. Like it's it's okay that it's changing, like it's okay that it's dynamic and fluid. And like I don't feel pressure to like pin that down and be okay, this is this is what's what's going on with me and like if it changes next week, we'll we'll adapt and move on to that. Um, it, Ra Rachel, you also I'm gonna guess uh, are okay with the 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 moniker of geek. Oh yes, absolutely. Yes. Have have the uh, have you two found that the the community of of geeks is more or less accepting of your brands of weirdness? Uh, it depends on which geek community, because while there are a lot of them, and, and there are a lot of them that are weirdly rigid in their geekness, um, and then there are a lot of them that are a lot more open and flowy. Um, I think it's, it's really interesting that... Um, I don't know. You hear you hear stuff on the internet about um, Star Wars people fighting with Star Trek people and those all that stuff. And really, it's generally toxic white males fighting with other people that are not toxic white males. Um, and so, a lot of the communities are a lot more welcoming than you realize once you get past some of the gatekeepers, right? The, the gatekeep people that that want to keep you out um and that's that's definitely something that we found a lot of people who are nerdy and geeky and um and also queer and and trans and and open to all kinds of things which is great i think gatekeepers exist everywhere oh yeah absolutely um, i i know in in the arts which is where i hang out mostly there are definitely gatekeepers and and obvious ones in in geekery. Um, I have found, however, that given a little bit of time and effort, geeks or sorry, weirdos and geeks tend to find each other. Um, do you do you have like a, a a cluster of of co weirdos that you hang with? Yeah, definitely. Um... And, and they're gathered from all kinds of different places, uh, all kinds of people and places. And I think one of the things that I've found is, is that different types of geeks and weirdos, once you get past the like kind of toxic gatekeeper-y people, we band together because we know that, that we are all the, the outsiders and we are the ones that if we can support each other and that's you know something that we do is we try to support each other then um we'll be sorry there's a cat there is a cat <laughs> that's a good tale though um that if we support each other then we'll be we'll be much better and happier i got distracted by the cat and trailed off that's okay <laughs> cat cat is a special extra guest I know. Um, what's the cat's name? That is Laurel. Laurel. And then we also have a cat, Selena, who is currently sleeping on a Totoro cape. <laughs> because it's us. Yeah. Your 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 geekery is a consistent part of your life throughout, it seems. Uh, and you're raising a family? Yes, we have a kiddo. Is your kiddo a weirdo? He is definitely a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> he is absolutely a weirdo. Would you have been disappointed if he weren't? Maybe a little bit, like an Alex P. Keaton situation. Right, I, I right. actually we talked about that when <laughs> when um 
when our kid was was younger that like what if what if he's what if he's like conservative or something when he when he grows up and I don't know that that's possible with with the upbringing he's had but his very first protest was the Prop 8 protest mm. and he was in a sling um, as we went around and around and around the the temple yelling at at the Mormons that was the very first protest he was in and it just got worse from there so i think um a, a lot of a lot of the the alex p keaton effect um comes from having an upbringing that you feel the need to rebel against mm -hmm. you know, I, I i don't think that that someone is is naturally going to rise up with with one political view or another but if you are raised um in a loving and accepting family, you're less likely to feel the need to go the opposite way. You may not agree with everything, but I, but you're, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people talk like rebellion is a necessary part of growing up and maybe a little, but I'm, I'm not sure it is. Not really. Yeah, I, I think boundary pushing is a necessary part of growing up and figuring out where you belong in your family and where, what, what your space is like. But I think if you're able to open up conversation and open up communication that all of you can exist together and you don't, I don't know, I, I feel like we don't push on each other in a sense that there needs to be a rebellion, you know, that. Well, and I think there's a sense that that pushing is always going to be safe, that like mm -hmm. if, if he wanted to push a boundary, it's like, okay, you can here's where you can push it or here's how you can push it. Or like, we see that you're pushing it, but never like a, don't do that, stop that, it's not right. Like, I think it's much more of a like, you know, if you're pushing something that like is dangerous, okay, here's the reasoning behind it. Here's why, why we're thinking about this, or let's, let's take this slowly, or let's like figure out how we're going to work with this. You know, I don't think there's ever a like hard stop or a like, nope, you're not, we're not going to let you do this. We're not going to let you be this. In uh, in my experience, um, that um, that can tie into uh, the autism thing because we tend to not like rules just for their own sake. We sort of have mm -hmm. to understand them. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And 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 growing up being told just because I said so is so. Yeah, I I don't even know what it's it just terrible you know and yeah. and being when when you ask for clarification being treated like you're you're challenging when really mm -hmm. you're just trying to understand is so frustrating or and, even worse that fear of punishment right like you like i grew up i was out of line i have my ass beat you know that was just that was how parenting okay i I take a step back from that because I don't think saying that's how parenting was like that's that's a pretty broad stroke, but it was a it was a popular and accepted parenting technique, right? Mm -hmm. like physical right. discipline was, was a thing that was tacitly accepted, and like we've learned so much about how like that affects your development and affects your growth. Like if you have somebody that's like doing physical punishment as as a way to like mold or shape your behavior like it's so harmful it's so harmful well even from birth we tried to always explain why mm -hmm. even even if we knew that he wasn't going to understand what we were saying we still tried to explain why we were doing what we we're doing i'm going to change your diaper so i'm going to have to take your clothes off in order to do that like just talking about what what I'm doing and why and anytime mm -hmm. we have a like have a statement where I need you to do this thing there's always a why behind mm -hmm. it and and when I ask do you want to blah I'm ready to accept a no and I think that's a huge huge thing where a lot of people are like yeah let me ask if ask for your consent but then if you say no then you're you're basically emotionally punished for that and how being many able kids, to no is huge how many kids have been forced to hug the creepy aunt you know yep. yeah absolutely yeah. and even ask like 
can I have a hug? Well, if the answer is no, but and you do the hug anyway, then that's and what's the value of consent the, in that relationship, right? right? Like, right. what's the what is that teaching? And consent's been a huge theme for our parenting because every everything involves consent. It's not a sexual thing. Mm -hmm. It's everything, and that's always been huge in something that we've tried to teach him from from birth and something that we try to practice all the time with him as well so well because he's Which a person helps, and it right? makes us weirdos apparently yeah, yeah. To do <laughs> that, that kind of parenting that's <laughs> outside the norm but yeah there's that um treating him like a person like and i think that's so uh, like you we've always been irritated like when you go to the restaurant as a family and like the server asks us what he wants to eat like, no, and it's like, no, no, he can make a choice. He can like, he can decide, he can have agency about, and we'll step in if it's something like, okay, no, we're not going to buy the $34 steak dinner right now. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, he's got to be able to make those choices, particularly now, because that's, that's the, this is the time for trying those things out safely so that he has the confidence when he does it as an adult. I remember once when I was a kid, I ordered a salad because I liked salads, which is unusual mm -hmm. for a kid. And and just the look the waiter gave me. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was like I was uh, uh, had been kidnapped or something. It's like, bl blink <laughs> twice if you need help. <laughs> <laughs> I like salad. I did, you know. Um, and uh, for me, and this is kind of unusual among autistic folks, the variety of texture was 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 probably more appealing than than any other aspect of it. Um, you uh, mentioned a while back the temple. Uh, when we met, you lived in Utah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you now live in, somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. I can never remember where. In Oregon. Yeah. Or in Oregon. Yep. Um, what what's that like what it, you know was there a culture shock or or uh is it more accepting freeing in a way yeah, like yeah. i think i never understood sort of the there's two things that i think happen living in utah one of them is there is always this like cognitive load of having to deal with like the conservative culture and that's primarily focused on by the church right um and you don't you don't see it until it's gone right like you don't really feel it until it's not there and you're like oh i can live without this i could i could like be okay without having this constant like pressure and that kind of leads to the other thing where like I think what happens in Utah is that communities become very close knit because they have something to fight against. Right. They have like a unifying presence that they can they can kind of shake their fist and be upset at. Um, one of the the difficult things that I've had to deal with living here is that like being weird is kind of normal. Like it's it's there's no, I mean. Portland's mascot, unofficial mascot, is the Unipiper, who like drives around on his unicycle with his flaming bagpipes and his Darth Vader outfit. And like you run into him in the city sometimes, and there he is just being the Unipiper. Um, and that's normal. Like that's that's okay. That's not like looked down on or seen as like, oh well, you know, what's what's gonna happen with that guy then when he has to go to, you know, does he take that thing into his ward when he goes to you know, drive down the aisles of the church to like go sit? Like no, nobody, nobody cares. I think definitely one of those moments of like, we're not in Utah anymore was um, we were talking to at the time, our neighbor downstairs who was an older white woman. Um, and you just sort of make this assumption like and, and assumptions are terrible i have to say but it 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 happens in your head that she was conservative because that's what she probably would be in utah right. like i would say 
80, 90 percent of the old white women in Utah probably are <laughs> conservative and Mormon. Um, and so we were talking to her and she just started going, and that Donald Trump guy, I just like, and, and we're like, oh, yeah, you know, we're somewhere else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we're, and also when um, a really big thing was was how well our kids school handled it when he came out as trans and queer at school mm -hmm. and the lengths they went to to support him and and make sure that he felt like he was welcome and that they talked to the you know the students and helped with introducing that and he was was actually the first out queer and trans kid in his elementary school um but they still stepped right in and i even at some of the best schools in utah there have been stumbles with kids coming out as trans um and and i think in general the public this is the public school system here yeah and and it it's been definitely very different to see the amount of support i mean i his district two years ago in june of 2020 when a, the protests started all over the united states set, came out with a statement that said black lives matter and here's what we're doing and here's how we're supporting and here's what we're doing right now i would not have seen that in utah there's no school district in utah i know because i used to work for a school district in utah that would have come out and said black lives matter they just wouldn't you know no but they absolutely would have come out with a statement in favor of police yeah mm -hmm. yes oh yeah and how definitely like yeah yeah um i honestly i'm i'm, I'm a little tired of utah and i, I keep thinking that that your your region of the country might might be a, a good fit um as current news events are looking a bit ugly in the lgbt realm yeah yeah, yeah. Um, i, I kind of want to be among more like-minded people you know? mm -hmm. yeah and it's it's a safety thing too and it's hard because i don't i feel some guilt for abandoning the communities that i helped support and create and foster in utah but at the same time there comes a point where you're so tired that you've just got to do something different and help recharge your energies and and support from a different space and if that means it's farther away then that's what it has to be in order for your own brain you know yeah and if you think about it in terms of like spoon theory like living in utah is like you have five spoons, but one spoon is always taken up with this thing. By it's the church. always <laughs> taken up with dealing with the church and the conservative stuff and all this, like, and it's like getting a spoon back. It's like, wait, I actually have, like, some energy and some opportunity to handle something else. You know, what? What? what is that? And there's a little bit of wrestling with that and mm -hmm. like what what do you do with that like you know now that you have that energy what can you put it towards or what can you what can you think about with it uh one of the groups i i don't know if you were a founder the one to five club um is that uh, still is that still going yes it is still going um and i was sort of involved in the creation yeah the, like one of the very first like mods um and both of us were and i was involved in the group that existed before the one to five club which was by poly utah and the by poly utah separated out into the utah polyamory society and then the one to five club got created as well because there was a need for those two communities mm -hmm. to have their own spaces um and so yeah that's kind of the history some of the history stuff there and for anyone watching who doesn't get the reference, can can you explain what one to five means? Yes. Yeah, so the Kinsey scale is zero to six, and zero being you're quite straight, and six meaning you're quite gay, and the one to fives are all the people in the middle, um, the the outsiders, the edge cases. The yes, right. mm -hmm. yes. And and calling it the one to five club. Um, I think neatly skirts around some of the the bi versus pan um, conflict, um, yep. needless conflict in in my opinion. But 
Uh, so, so that's, uh, yeah, I, I've attended a, a few of the things, but, um, I don't know. I'm not as social as I used to be. <laughs> Neither are we. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think some of that's the, the pandemic. Yeah. I think that's, that's caused us to be really hesitant about going out in public for things. Um, and some of us just, we're introverts. Like we, we're, we, we like connecting with people for short periods of time and then retreating to our solitude to process two or three times the amount of time that we spent with the people. Or more. Or more. <laughs> and recover. Back to our, our geeky. Yeah. Geeky and that's stuff. okay. You know, that's fine. It is. Now, uh, we are getting into the final segment. Um, so my final question is generally, do you have any advice for up and coming weirdos and or advice you would give to yourself when you were younger that might have helped? I'll take a crack at that first. Um, I think, I think the, the, the sort of general advice is for weirdos is, um, find your people because they're out there. Right. Um, there's some amazing communities around like just about anything that you're interested in or anything that you like really take to heart. And most, if not all of them will be open and welcoming. Like, I think there's always that little bit of hesitancy about like, Oh, I'm going to, going to be involved in this thing. I'm going to like get into Dr. Who fandom, or I'm going to get into, um, the one oddball one I have is um, I'm a huge fan of women's soccer uh, of and what? women's soccer. Oh yes, of, of professional women's soccer, and like the supporters groups around women's soccer and women's soccer itself are massively inclusive, and they're they're kind of the like the example I hold up is um, the Rose City Riveters from Portland, um, and their sort of membership credo is if you want to be a Rose City Riveter, you already are one. I love that. And I think like there's, it's one example of so many really diverse welcoming groups. The advice that I would give myself, um, younger me, myself, would be to worry less. Like I, I worried about how I think it's the thing that happens as weirdos is like you worry about how your weirdness appears to other people. Like you worry about how you portray that and you worry about whether that will get you in trouble and you worry about whether other people will get it. Screw them. Like seriously, like I would have had such a happier childhood and happier time as a younger adult if I gave less of a shit about what other people thought about me. That's my speed. Yeah, I think I think a big thing I would say to myself and the people out there is absolutely nothing is as dichotomous as you think it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, like all of these opposites and dichotomies that we've been taught from when we were babies, good and bad, black and white, happy and sad, they're actually not dichotomies. And I would like to invite people to think about how much more complicated everything is um, than, than thinking about it being one way or another. I think that's both of those are, are, are good things to share. Um, yeah, the whole dichotomy thing. I mean, we can we can blame Greek philosophers for, for that somewhat. Um, I, I saw uh i think it was an episode of qi where they talked about how there's no such thing as a fish are you familiar with that mm -hmm. the 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 idea is they they tried to pin down taxonomically what is and what isn't a fish and there mm -hmm. are no attributes that universally identify the fish and exclude the not fish um, mm -hmm. so there is no boundary between fish and not fish so in a sense, there's no such thing as a fish. And I actually found that really interesting and, and kind of 
That's, that's a phrase I kind of mutter to myself sometimes when I, I see things mm -hmm. being a bit too black and white. Uh, Sounds similar to a lot of other things going on in, in the news media right now. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I won't, I won't say there's no such thing as a gender, but there's no such thing as a gender binary. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, that does it for us. Uh, so this has been uh, Rachel and Alex. I am Skix. This is Here Comes the Weirdo Parade. Stay yeah, tuned for the theme song, good. which is going to get stuck in your head for at least another week. So you want to come back next Monday and watch. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and we'll see you next time. God bless you all. God save the king. Yeah. Oh.